Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala ekremil enbiya'i ve mursalin. Seyyidina ve Mevlana ve Habibina Muhammed ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecma'in. We're working our way now through the uh, blessed month, this uh, challenging time of year when everything becomes intensified, when sabr is not just necessary but easier, when we learn the vital and really rather cheerful lesson that we are capable of restraining ourselves and disciplining the nafs, and a time when we recognize that uh, the fast is not just about tarq, abandonment of certain outward actions, but is about the tarq or the abandonment of certain inward states as well. Uh, we know that uh, in the month of Ramadan, Sufidati Shayateen, the shaitans are chained up. And one of the meanings of this is that the shaitan is uh, less able to get at us through these inward weaknesses. Shaitan's assails of the outward fiqh of Ramadan is usually not very grave. Inshallah, we're not at immediate risk of running to the fridge and getting ourselves a cool drink. This hadith refers to the inward qualities that Ramadan must be cultivating, Ramadan as a moral academy. And one of the things it seems to me that uh, is most uh, dogged uh, in the human soul is the problem of having too grand an opinion of ourselves. Ja, shahra, there's lots of Arabic words that apply to this. And this is particularly a problem, it seems, in our modern world where everything is about the self. Be yourself, experience yourself, indulge yourself, discover yourself, without there being <coughs> much by way of a footnote explaining what exactly the self might be. But the self which wishes to boast, which wants to uh, strut its stuff and flex its biceps in front of an admiring public, the self that wishes to be the qibla of mankind, but which nonetheless turns out, if we look within ourselves and consider what it actually is, to be a rather cobwebby, weedy, ghost-like thing without much substance. It's all show, it's all facade. <clears throat> it does seem to love covering up its own sense of weakness and feebleness and its own knowledge of what it's really like, if it has that knowledge, by producing a facade which it shows to human beings. So we are a different kind of person with different sorts of people. Now, there is a way in which that can be morally appropriate. And this is why he says, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Umirtu an unzila nasa manazilahum. I've been commanded to deal with people according to their state, according to their level, to what they are. So necessarily, the way in which we speak to a new Muslim is going to be different to the way in which we speak to a grey-bearded sheikh. The way in which we speak to family is going to be different to the way in which we speak to somebody who we happen to meet on the bus. And this is kind of obvious and part of the, uh, the, the normal sort of common sense and practical wisdom that a human being accumulates. But the state within us that wishes rather desperately to be admired, this is problematic. And this is not from Mahasan al-Akhlaq from the goodness of character. And it seems that Ramadan is a time when we're all a little bit broken, the blood sugar level is down, the natural exuberance of the nafs is a little bit less, sofi dati shayateen, the devils are chained, chained up. When we can start to be a bit more attentive and mindful to the way in which we present our public image to the world. How do we wish to be thought of? And this has become something of a modern epidemic because it can be electronically quantified. All of those teenagers and influencers and YouTubers who are absolutely desperate to get as many likes as they can and take this to be an affirmation of themselves as human beings. <clears throat> they crave <clears throat> public adulation. 
And this is a very worrying because very transient and invariably wrong way of behaving towards Bani Adam. Humility is <coughs> one of the most beautiful virtues of the religion. And the characteristic virtue of Islam is Haya. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Li kulli deen in khuluq wa khuluqul Islam al Haya. Every religion has a particular quality or character trait, and that which is particular to Islam is that of modesty. And modesty in Arabic, as in English, uh, means those two related things simultaneously. Modesty in terms of not being obscene and dressing modestly, but also modesty in the sense of not drawing attention to one's real or imagined virtues or achievements. The precarity of this is evident. All of those young people, those YouTubers, those influencers, if they see the number of likes and the number of hits and the number of replays declining, sometimes they have to go for counselling. They feel that their self has been diminished because their self is only affirmed by the affirmation of others, unknown others, perhaps perverse, strange others, perhaps robotic others, they have no means of knowing whether the esteem of those others is actually something which one would wish for in any case. So uh, we have in our religion this very drastic way of talking about uh, superbia, pride, which is said traditionally to be the greatest of the seven deadly sins. And it's related uh, issue of jah, hubb al jah, the love of status. Uh, and the Holy Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, when he speaks of this, uses quite absolute and intense language. In a, a well-known hadith, it's in Ibn Majah, but it's a reputed hadith, he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, akhwafu ma akhafu ala ummati arriya'u wa shuhratil khafiya that which I fear most for my ummah is showing off and the hidden passion. That which he fears most. Well, we know that what is worse, what is unforgivable, is shirk, but this is precisely the hidden passion. Because to the extent that one is manifesting virtues that might be religious virtues to others, one is committing some kind of lesser shirk shirk ashar, because as well as doing things for the Lord of the Worlds, you are hoping for the praise of mortal, fallible, frail, temporary human beings. And this is a diversification of the Qibla and hence looks like a near neighbor to shirk. It's a form of polytheism. You might speak of the polytheism of status seeking. We care about God's opinion, but we also really care a lot about the world's opinion. How do I look? How is this look? How is my CV? What are people saying about me? What is on the discussion groups and all of this nonsense? Which is irrelevant because only the judgment of the judge, capital J, carries any weight and is worth having and is objective. So we find that in the time of the Salaf, Ridwanullahi alayhim, there was a tremendous anxiety about publicly appearing in connection with religion in particular. So we know that Khalid bin Ma'dan, who is one of the great Imams of early Islam, إِذَا كَثُرَتْ حَلْقَتُهُ قَامَ مَخَافَةُ الشُّهْرَةِ He's a great Hadith scholar, but when his circle became large and there was a crowd there, he would stand up and leave <laughs> because he was afraid that he might be becoming famous, and that might affect him. His intention was the preservation of the words of the Holy Prophet wasallam, and all of these admiring gazes might turn him into a celebrity, and celebrity culture is the opposite of Tawhidi culture, because it's the approbation of the many and the fallible, rather than the approbation of the one who is infallible. There's also a story told about Ubay bin Ka'b, إِذْ يَمْشِي فِي أَصْحَابِهِ وَهُمْ خَلْفَهُ إِذْ رَآهُ عُمَرَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْ فَعَلَاهُ بِالدُرَّةِ 
قال يا أمير المؤمنين ما تصنع قال إن هذه ذلة للتابع وفتنة للمتبوع So Ubay bin Ka'ab is walking and his pupils, his companions, are walking behind him. And Umar, Amir al-Mu'mineen, comes and raises his famous stick. And Ubay says, O commander of the faithful, what are you doing? And he says, this way of walking is a humiliation for those who are following and a danger for the one who is followed. Everybody loses because they're kind of humbly kind of staggering behind you uh, in this demeaning way, which is not how the Holy Prophet والسلام, walked with his ashab, or he was in the middle of them. <coughs> uh, but it's also a fitna, a source of temptation and sedition and subversion for the one who's being followed. In other words, it's a danger for them and it's bad adab towards them, but it's a danger for you because you might think, well, I am not just at the beginning of the caravan, but I am actually the most eminent amongst them, which you do not know and which you cannot know. So one of the lessons that we can learn from the early Muslims is a real fear, even a terror of being famous, of celebrity culture, of getting lots of likes and approvals for its own sake, because they saw this as being a near neighbor to shirk and something that was extremely, extremely subversive. So some of them used to <coughs> do quite drastic things in order to reduce the level of uh, fame. Uh, and some of them would, for instance, pretend to be doing things that are not forbidden, but are kind of just mubah, not particularly amiable in Sharia. Some of them would even colour their water that they would drink in public so that it would look like wine or some other forbidden fluid uh, in order to reduce their celebrity status. And this is recorded of a lot of the early Muslims. The ulama, however, say that this is only permissible in the case of somebody who is not emulated. Otherwise, if people think Sheikh so-and-so is drinking wine, that's going to cause a lot of his faithful disciples to fall into error. That is not permissible. But for the ordinary Muslim who is afraid that perhaps his sincerity is being damaged by this <coughs> proliferation of, of followers and by the fact that people regard him as a very respectable and honourable and upright member of the community, it is uh, sometimes, according to the Mashaykh, a very valuable remedy just to kind of appear not to be anything special. This has to be handled with extreme caution and discretion. Usually one spiritual director will be, will be in charge of that process. Remember the great Mufti of Bursa, uh, one of the early capitals of the Ottoman Empire, Aziz Mahmoud Huday, the chief Qadi and a very magnificent, important person in the state, who wished to follow a teacher in the inward path. And the teacher saw that he was attached to his celebrity status, the Ottoman Mufti with the enormous turban <coughs> and the fur kaftan and walking around with the Sultan <coughs> hobnobbing with the uh, so-called great and the good, and the ego is certainly attached to those things. And in order to break his pride, he commanded him, saying, if you wish to become my student, you will have to go in your Qadi's robes into the bazaar, the marketplace in Bursa, selling tripe, and call out at the top of your voice, Cierge, Cierge, the tripe seller, the tripe seller. And he found this extraordinarily difficult. And that was his first lesson, in a sense, his first real lesson in the inner akhlaq of Islam, having mastered the outward science of ijtihad and fatwa, was this overcoming of the ego. But he did it, and as a result, um, his teacher took him as a disciple, and he became somebody whose khutbas immediately attracted vast crowds of people whose hearts melted because they could see 
that he was a person of humility. In our time, this fitna of which uh, Sayyidina Omar speaks, the fitna of having admiring disciples and pupils, has become genuinely subversive. The Grand Mufti of somewhere, uh, the secretary of some Islamic university, the minister of religious affairs with his state limousine and hobnobbing with useless generals and uh, other not inspiring personalities, uh, has become a genuine fitna. And some of them manage to escape that fitna. Others are carried away by it and become inwardly just a kind of feather blown by the wind. Nothing there. And this, again, can be uh, a fitna for those who follow them. If the Mufti is known to be somebody who really cares about which angle the photographer is taking his portrait from, uh, somebody who makes sure that he's in the front line at the state banquet and is served with the best things, that he has a new 500 series Mercedes and gets into that world, well, that's a real subversion of prophetic religion and people will be disillusioned by that person. So this is to do, finally, with the hadith Man sanna fil islami sunnatun hasana falahu ajruha wa ajru man amila biha ila yawmil qiyamah Whoever does a good thing, a good sunnah in Islam or introduces a good practice into Islam shall have its reward and the reward of those who acted with it until the day of judgment. But conversely also, the sunnah sayyah, the bad thing that that person represents. Uh, one is if the shepherd is corrupt, then the flock are likely to be in danger. So, to conclude, this issue of status, of seeking to be a celebrity, kafa bil mar'i min sharri an yushara ilayhi bil asabi fi dinihi wa dunya. It is a sufficient evil for somebody that people should be pointing at him because of something he has in deen or in dunya. And we need to be constantly vigilant of this. And it doesn't just apply, apply to scholars and billionaires and YouTube influencers and other celebs. And there's a very dangerous celebrity culture amongst Muslims, unfortunately, which comes in from the outside world and people collecting prizes of various kinds and going to Islam piety awards <coughs> and this kind of nonsense as if uh, it was a sort of the voice or a beauty competition of some, some profane kind. This is very alien to our tradition. And <coughs> we need to be looking out for those who are not pointed to, the people who nobody attributes much status to, the poor, the weak, the disabled, the marginalized, the little old lady who sits in the corner of the mosque and nobody really wants to talk to her. Ah, those are the people where the divine favor is likely to be found. It is amongst them that we are likely to find Allah's friends, the awliya. So religion really inverts the normal uh, hierarchy of the world. And this is part of its indispensability. So, yeah, it's better to be in a state of khumul, to be obscure, not to be known, particularly in a time such as ours of ridiculous <coughs> celebrity culture, fitna, distraction, superficiality of all kinds, uh, where unqualified people are ranking the ulama and even the awliya. And this is part of the absurdity and part of the fitna of the age. Islam is not democratic in that sense. Only God's judgment is true and matters. So in this month of Ramadan, inshallah, one of the things that we will be considering is the front that we put up in public. Are we showing off to people? Are we consciously strutting our stuff and making sure that we look like really good Muslims? Are we very happy when we are quoting a hadith that the other person perhaps doesn't know? Are we very happy when we correct somebody's religious mistake? All of this is mineral or net in nefs from the roughnesses of the lower self and is profoundly subversive and may not formally break the fast but is a dishonorable and an inappropriate state to be in particularly in this month which is the month of purity and the month of iqbal ala Allah of turning back to Allah so may Allah inshallah 
uh, just as he purifies our outward from certain passions and desires, purify our inward state, our sarira, from certain other passions and desires and keep us away from this shirk khafi, this hidden idolatry of longing to be a celebrity. Barakallahu fikum, wa taqabbala siyamakum, wa salamu alaykum, wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.